Major stories in the Bible were clearly based on truth. I thought it was a kid. The Tower of Babel, the subject of one of the strangest stories in the Bible. But could it be based on truth? I thought as a kid this was folklore, a legend. And then a lot of people still think of it in biblical terms as some kind of legend. But they don't really know that it actually existed. I'm really at the place where the tower stood. The fragile remains of the legendary city of Babylon in modern-day Iraq have revealed many secrets. The greatest of all was the discovery of a vast structure that ancient records suggest was the Tower of Babel. Ancient texts have allowed experts to imagine what the building might have looked like. But now, astounding new evidence has emerged. Inscribed on the surface of a privately owned tablet is an image that sensationally reveals exactly what the Tower of Babel looked like. This figure is a very strong piece of evidence that the Tower of Babel story in the Bible was inspired by this real building. This remarkable tablet, which has never been filmed before, dates to the 6th century BC. It was discovered in Babylon over a century ago. Unbelievably, no one realized how important it was until Professor Andrew George, an expert in ancient texts, brought its fake carvings back to life. At the top here, this part, there is a relief uh, depicting a step tower. And here, a great a figure of a human being carrying a staff with a conical hat on. Below that relief is a text which has been chiseled into the monument and uh, the label is easily read. It, it reads Aten and Anki, Zikurat Babu, and that means the Zikurat or Temple Tower of the city of Babylon. This tablet provides the first ever image of the real Tower of Babel. It confirms the building was a Mesopotamian stepped tower and illustrates the seven tiers of the ancient megastructure. Significantly, it also clearly identifies the man behind it. Mesopotamia's most famous ruler, King Nebuchadnezzar II. The building and its builder are on the same, uh, on the same relief. But while the images are extraordinary, the tablet's ancient text also reveals a detailed account of the tower's construction. And more importantly, how Nebuchadnezzar went about building it. <coughs> it reads from the upper sea, which is the Mediterranean, to the lower sea, and that's the Persian Gulf. The far-flung lands and teeming people of the habitations are mobilized in order to construct <coughs> this building of the Ziggurat of Babylon. Incredibly, this ancient account is identical to the biblical story of how the Tower of Babel was constructed. For scholars, the tablet offers further proof that the Tower of Babel wasn't just a work of fiction. It was an actual building from antiquity. All right. the now, I wanted you to note, I wanted to read something in Genesis 11. I wanted to note the detail. It says here, they said to one another, come let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone in bitumen for mortar. You might read asphalt or tar. That's the kind of detail telling you what they're building and the building materials. How's that line up? Let's see if this video works. This is an original brick from Babylon. It carries traces of an unusual construction material from the time. Bitumen, an ancient tar mortar that's specifically mentioned in the biblical tale. Tucked in the corner of this case is something very interesting for people who are interested in the Tower of 
Babel, because this is one of the actual bricks which Nebuchadnezzar commissioned. We know it's Nebuchadnezzar because there's a stamped inscription on the front. And on the edge, you can see, this murky black stuff, this is bitumen. In the book of Genesis, it literally says that they use brick for stone and bitumen for water. It's expressly said there. What we have here is one brick and its bitumen, which fits exactly into that special context. <coughs> This archaeologist said this, there's a large pool, they, and you see the picture today, you don't see a building, but you see kind of an open area. And he said this large pool at modern Babylon is over the ruins of an early structure that was possibly the original Tower of Babylon. To give you an idea about how long we've known in history, does anybody remember the historian Herodotus? He said this, he said, it was still in existence in my time. It has a solid central tower, one stadium square, with a second erected on top of it, and then a third, and so on up to eight. All eight towers can be climbed in it by a spiral way running uh, around the outside, and about halfway up there are seats for those who make the ascent to rest on it. So he was a Greek historian from the 5th century BC. Here's what he wrote about, and you saw what he wrote there about the Tower of Babel. You'll see another name here. Uh, when you see that um, Edomenaki, that's a, uh, it's one of the names given the Tower of Babel. So it's, it's a, like a synonym, it's another way to refer to it. So what happened? We have Nebuchadnezzar. King of the Babylonian Empire, they started to reconstruct it. Anybody remember what happened to the Babylonian Empire? They were toppled by the Medo-Persian Empire. They started to continue. They wanted to continue the reconstruction of putting this tower together. They were conquered by the Greeks and Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great decided that perhaps it was time to just tear it down to the bottom and build it back up scratch. What happened to Alexander the Great? He died at 30. Murdered. Died very early and never got around to building it. And that's why you see here, and that's why I just kind of said there, Alexander the Great ordered the old tower destroyed in an effort to be rebuilt, but his untimely death left nothing but, it, but its footprint in the ground where the foundation had even been dug out. That's why there's a pool there to this day. So, and you can kind of get an idea from this picture about the size of it. It's about a football stadium by a football stadium square. So, very large piece. Um, now, if you remember, if you were with us during Christmas, we talked about the, the Middal Tower down in Bethlehem, or just outside of Bethlehem. Well, Middal means tower, and uh, figuratively or metaphorically speaking, it's a pyramidal bed of flowers. And how many have actually looked at the design? You notice the specific design of this tower? Did you know that there's ziggurats like that around the world? Wonder where they got the idea for that design. Well, all the people groups were gathered where? In one place before the Tower of Babel. So it must have been that of those 70, those 70 or so groups, I guess some of them were builders, and so they went, as they dispersed, and took the knowledge they had with them. And so you'll see examples of that all around the world. So they took this same building project with them as they were dispersed around the world, but where did the Irish come from? Where did the Spanish come from? Where did the Chinese come from? Evolution teaches that there are higher and lower races, and the Bible teaches that there's one race, the human race. The research connects us in a powerful way. You're going to find that there are reliable historical documents that tell us how we're related to one another. And that's what we're about to do now. 
And again, we read this verse earlier, and he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, may Canaan be his servant, and may God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. I want you to take a look at that verse. <coughs> Tell me, of the three sons of Noah, which one might actually have covered or dispersed over more land than the others? Which one would you say? Now, why would you say Japheth? Well, let's find out if he did. How's that? This is, I guess I can go right here. This would be a, a map of Japheth and kind of some of the areas he, he went. Everybody can see that? That one is, which one would you guess? Is that Shem or is that Ham? What's the giveaway? What did we say? Shem? We have a word we use today that comes from Shem. What is it? Semitic people. Yes. And where would those Semitic people be? This part of the world, wouldn't it? And then we have an idea of where Ham's children went. So that's kind of an overview. Now we'll get into a few details here. Let's see how far we get. Where did the Irish and Scots come from? How many of you would have, uh, if you traced your genealogy, would go back to Ireland or Scotland? Several of you. Wouldn't you like to know where they came from, besides Ireland and Scotland? Well, you'll see here. They could have come by water. Now, why would that be possible? What were Noah and his sons? What, would, what were they good at doing? <laughs> so do you think they might have been able to travel by sea? So they could have come by water, or they could have gone by land. And historically, the Phoenicians and the Greeks were master sailors, and the descendants of Japheth inhabited a number of coastal areas. Yeah, Jerry. Wouldn't it also have been uh, the time where the the world were the earth was still close to each other before no. the continent split? That's or, a great question. Or would there have been wouldn't that have also been around the time of the Ice Age? That would be where we would go with it. Um, has anybody seen their understanding, uh, at least what the conjecture is, or actually pretty good belief? We were all basically one landmass before the flood. Have you ever noticed if you take the continents, it's called Pangaea, and if you take the continents, they kind of almost fit together like a puzzle. What broke all that up? Well, it was a lot more than the floods going on. There were earthquakes. It was all. It was. It was catastrophic. What happened? Yep. So that all happened in that year to year and a half from the flood to the time it finally dried. So if, can you imagine if you were Noah and his family, when you get off the ark, you're coming to a world that's very, very different than the one that you knew before the flood? Very different. Mountains where there weren't mountains before. And then there's waterways and the rivers that you knew were around, they're, they're not there anymore. It's just a very different world. So there were two possibilities there for the Irish and the Scots. It was water or, or land. Now, how would that happen? Well, the flood triggered what Jared brought up was an ice age. I got a couple. So there would be your land route. Now, interestingly enough, we had talked about where people that are uh, young earth creationists and evolutionists, they seem to disagree on everything. Almost everything. Here is something that they both agree about. They both agree that there was an ice age. Now, there may be a disagree on, disagreement on details, like how many ice ages and how long they were long ago, but we're in agreement that there was an ice age. Further, global cooling is not the same as an ice age. An ice age is a very rare event. To get an ice age, you have to have warm oceans and cool summers. Warm oceans so that you have more evaporation, so you have more snowfall in the winter. Cool summers. What would happen in the cool summers? 
Who's lived up north? Some of you? So tell me what happens to all the snow in the summer. Has anybody ever seen snow piled like 10, 20, 20, 10, 15 feet high in parking lots like at Walmart? I've seen so much snow, it's like, it's never going to melt. It all melts. But if you have cool summers, some of it doesn't all quite melt. And then what happens the next winter? More snow. Now you start having glaciers, and now the ice age, and now you're going to start having land. Um, so, all right, cool summers, the winter, you have more snow. It's a very rare condition. The flood of Noah's day provides the conditions for an ice age. Further, volcanoes erupting. Does anybody remember Mount St. Helens? Now, it's an interesting <coughs> phenomenon. When a volcano ha uh, erupts like that, it will put out particulates into the atmosphere that stay for several years. Those particulates tend to reflect some of the sunlight, the radiant heat. So guess what happens if you happen to have a pretty large volcano go off? It affects the weather pattern for the next couple of years. It's a little bit cooler. So you had that type of thing going on during the flood, as well as the flood itself. So a catastrophic event like a worldwide flood would lead to other events like volcanoes and earthquakes. So what happened when all of this water evaporates into the atmosphere and returns in the form of ice and snow? Well, you've got less water, and it forms something that we call land bridges. More land means that the continents that are not connected now would have been connected during an ice age. In fact... At the peak of the Ice Age, ocean levels dropped, they figure, up to 350 feet. Exposing in this area, when we're talking about Ireland and Scotland, something that's called Dodgerland. It looks like it's spelled, it's spelled different than we would pronounce it, but it's pronounced Dodgerland. And every once in a while, even to this day, some of those areas that are kind of shallow, when trawlers are... Fishing, they'll pull up artifacts as if people were actually living on this dry land, or are, are in this, in this, under this water. And it was actually the time of the Ice Age. I pulled a map. I found a map on, online. The map of the British Isles uh, from 1730. And there was kind of a mini Ice Age from the 1400s to the 1800s. Its peak was in the 1700s. And there's a section here called Dodger Bank. And it's noted on the maps like this because it was so shallow that ships could run aground on it. And that was just a few hundred years ago in a mini ice age. Imagine the full-blown ice age. So it's very easy to see how there would be, you would actually be able to walk all the way to Scotland and Ireland during an ice age on dry land. Now, why would those uh, people from Iraq desert, hot air, why would they want to go to Scotland and Ireland where it's so very cold? Well, was it cold? well yeah, at first I'm, I'm not sure what they knew or didn't know. Secondly, uh, God kind of made sure they got scattered, didn't they? But uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you one possibility when we talk about Spain. And then I think it'll make sense. We can't, I, I can't necessarily know their motivations. But I don't know how much cooler it was in areas that we looked at, an uh, arid desert. I don't know if it was quite that way right after the flood either. It might have been much more temperate. Let me read this to you. The posterity of Japheth inhabited most of the northern countries of Asia and all of Europe. Magog, one of the sons of Japheth, was the great ancestor of the Scythians. Scythians. And the several families that invaded the kingdom of Ireland after the flood, before the Milesians made a conquest of the island, and this will more fully appear in the body of this history. So there's been much study done in the history of Ireland, and this particular person was Geoffrey Keating. And uh, Milesians, or Milesians, I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing it right, Milesians, was a descendant of Magog as well. I'm going to show you how this all connects right here. 
So you got no. So if you're Irish, how does it all connect? Well, Noah had Japheth, Japheth had Magog, Magog had Bath. Then there was Phineus uh, of Farsa. And then Newell married Scota, a daughter of Pharaoh. And if you go down enough generations, you come to Milo, who would be considered the one that is the father of Ireland. So there was another, James Anderson was, this came from James Anderson, he was another historian, he was commissioned by the monarchy in England to put together these genealogies from around the world. And this is what James Anderson put together about the Irish. Milo became a king in what is called Spain today, and he took a migrant group to Ireland. And what about the Scots? Take a look at the names. Everybody looked at the names, kind of familiar with them? You don't have to memorize them, but... There's Scots. What do you notice? Pretty similar up until we get to here. In Milo, if I remember correctly, it's just kind of like a, a title, like chief or something. Like we would say king or chief. But notice, very similar in their heritage. Uh, Noah, Japheth, Magog, Bath, uh, Farsi, and Phineas. And uh, Ritha, Rifeth was known as the Scot. He's the father of the Scots. So you can see how they have a common ancestry, and then they see where they come different. So that, uh, that kind of tells you what, where the, going all the way back to Noah, where Scots and the Irish are similar, what they have in common, and then where they split off. And some ideas of what we think are reasonable, how they would have arrived at that island. So, how about this one? Where did the Spanish come from? Anybody have some sort of Spanish heritage or background from Spain? No? Okay. Now, if anybody wanted to say they all came from Babel, you'd be right every time. So, <laughs> But, again... They could have come by land, or they could have come by sea. So if you look at that, you see Noah, again through Japheth, and then this name called Tubal. And you see in parentheses all the variations to Tubal. These are all just different places. Um, so the ancient lineage of Spain goes from Noah to Japheth to Tubal. Um, does anybody remember what that peninsula in Portugal and Spain is called? The Iberian. The Iberian. You get a gold star and a purple jelly bean. Very good. <laughs> That's my boy. All right. <laughs> Iberian Peninsula. Where do you think that name came from? Anything up there look like it Everest? might come from that? Everest? Yeah. Uh, the, um, it's been known as ancient times, this Iberian Peninsula, which would be Portugal and Spain, it was known in ancient times as the land of Tubal. So before we called it Spain and Portugal, it was called the land of Tubal. You see some of the variant names of Tubal on the screen. Did you notice one of them? Why don't you kind of jump out at you? Which one do you see in the parentheses? Yeah, if you see it in the parentheses, which name jumps out at you in that parentheses? Iberi. No, in the parentheses here. Iberi. Iberis? How about this one? Pluto. Huh. You're talking about the dog that kind of bounces around? Dizzy? No? There was another Pluto, wasn't there? Does anybody remember who Pluto is? Uh huh. Uh, he was one of the Roman gods. Anybody see another name up there that might make you think of Roman and Greek gods? Atlas. Atlas. Yep. He's one of the Greek gods. And then Iberes. The Greek called him Iberes, which is where we get the Iberian Peninsula. And then, did you also see this name right here? Some variations of this one. Where's Gibraltar at? South. South of Spain, right? Yep. It's also known 
Gibraltar is known as the Pillar of Hercules. So, if we just take Japheth's son Tubal, he kind of got around. It's not just one people group that migrates to one place. Did you notice that I asked where you all came from or, or anybody in their family history? You all didn't just come from one place. It was amazing. Like, like Ernie was Norway and England to South Africa to here. And that's just in a couple hundred years. What we're talking about here took place in a couple hundred years as well. So if we could do it, why couldn't they do it? And so many of us had, I think, Romania and Ukraine. So we kind of just like bounce from here to here to here to here. Same thing is happening in that day as well. In the Bible, people migrated to Egypt, especially during a famine. Anybody remember who did that? Abraham, yeah. Abraham started that trend, and then it was, Jake, it was <laughs> Jacob bringing his entire family down. Uh -huh. So our ancestors followed a similar pattern. So for 100, 150 years, Tubal settled between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea and had settlements in what we call the Caucasian Iberia. And some of their descendants settled in, if you notice further, you go into Russia. What is uh, that place called where you really go out to the far end of Russia? It's called what? Iberia. Siberia. Iberia. Iberus. Do you see the connection? And uh, let's see, they, they added, uh, are you see, do you see the city up there on the right? You see the Tubal River? Do you see the, 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 the city of Tubal? And according to historical records, Tubal himself moved from the Caucasian Iberia to Spain and then to Morocco. One of Tubal's name is the Atlas. The Atlas Mountains are located in Morocco. The Atlantic Ocean is named for him as well. And you've all heard of the island of Atlantis? possible that it's connected with the same grandson of Noah. So, here's a little history on Spain. Early on in the land of Tubal, they found gold. Sarah, you were asking what the motivation was. Do you remember the 49ers? I'm not talking about the football team. What are they named after? The Gold Rush to California. Uh -huh. Well, the same thing was going on in Spain. So guess what happened as word got out there was gold in them Bar Hills. <laughs> they, people went to the land of Tubal to find their fortune. And one of those people was Aram. And among those people, Aram, Mesa, and Brigas, they all went to Spain and they ended up with a colony in Spain. And they're not the only ones. Remember I said something about the Irish and how they emigrated from Spain? Now you see that Milo. The descendants of Magog went to Spain, and that was Milo's grandfather conquered sections of Spain, and Milo ended up planting a colony in Ireland. Now there was another son of, J of Japheth, Remember how we said Japheth would be enlarged? We're going to keep, we're going to work with him for a little bit before we go. So let's read this. I'm going to, let me share this with you. Another son of Japheth to make it to Spain is Javan. Javan is actually the Hebrew name for Greece. Look it up in the Hebrew Old Testament. I went and looked at that in the Hebrew Old Testament. Oh, doggone, it is. Javan's son. Tarshish settled in the southern part of Spain. What do you remember Tarshish for? Saul. 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 Tarsus, but Jonah. Jonah. Remember, God told him to go to Assyria. He went the other way as far as he could go, and as far as you could go west was Tarshish. Mm -hmm. Where did that name come from? Javan's son. Read that. Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare, went down to it, 
to go with him to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Lots of people groups settled in Spain. You see on the screen how many different groups of people there are. Tubal, Aram, Magog, Libyans, and Egyptians. Uh, by the way, the Hebrew word for Egyptian, if we were reading, would be Mizraim. So when you see that word, that's just kind of a transliteration. But the Greeks, Javan, Phoenicians, Canaanites, Goths, Romans, Moors. As you can see, it gets very complicated and very mixed very quickly, doesn't it? All right. Have you guys any, have ever done anything like this before? In depth? Yeah. Tried to figure out Genesis 10? Okay, it looks like most are saying no, so good. I, terrible to find out everybody already done this. <laughs> but I thought, you know, sometimes we read a passage of Scripture and I, I don't know if you've ever read Genesis 10 with all the names. It's one of those you go, oh, man, do I have to read this one because I can't pronounce the names. What I'm hoping this does is I'm hoping this makes it more familiar for you so that the next time you see it, you're not saying, oh, i got to try to read it with all these names. You're actually excited about it. Like, this is amazing what's in here. I can't believe the Bible has all this stuff. This is the history of mankind. Where did the Germans and English and Scandinavians come from? Okay, I know we said we had some that said they had an English history with uh, England, their, their ancestors. Any Germans? There we go. Scandinavians? Any of those countries? Okay. These three share a common ancestry. We're going to start with, uh, again, Noah and Japheth. Germany is rather straightforward. We have a list of kings going all the way down to a general named Wolfheim Stickinger. From there, it broke into three kingdoms. So Germany was basically one kingdom that broke into three kingdoms, and then it became many small kingdoms for a long time. But in the early years, it was unified into one kingdom. It was the Romans that gave the country the name of Germany. Now notice there should be something here. Is there a name up there that catches your attention? Gomer? Gomer? I know what I want to do next, right? Go, oh, right? <laughs> I think that's another goal, though, right? Ashkenaz. Anybody recognize that name? Um, Ashkenazi. Sephardic and Ashkenazi. I'll unpack that more in just a minute. Not Nazi, no. <laughs> Look at the map. You guys see the map there? Japheth, Gomer, Ashkenaz? Ashkenaz settled just north of the Black Sea. Some of his descendants moved back to Asia Minor. And Ashkenaz moved to Europe with 20 of his sons. Gives you an idea how long these people lived in that day. Noah lived 350 years after the flood. And Shem lived about 600 years after the flood. So... You see here, the Germanic people, they were in uh, this group, Gomer and Ashkenaz, Germany, northwestern Turkey, southwestern region of the Caspian Sea, northeastern region of the Black Sea, Goths, Visigoths, Ostrogoths, Anglo-Saxons, Norse, Iceland, mixing with many of the Teutons from Tyrus. So this is just this family. Look how far they go and how where they, the different places they stretch out to. Now, I'm going to show you some variations of that name, Ashkenaz. The old name for the Black Sea was the Askin Sea. And Euxine, which you see Black Sea, is a variation of Askin. Look at some of the son's names. There's Danus. What does that sound like that would be? That would be the Danish, the Danes, yep. Notice... Um, that's Anglo-Saxon, where did that come from? Again, that's a variation of Ashkenaz. Scandinavia, another variation of Ashkenaz. Now, um, Ashkenaz, I want to bring that up because has anybody heard of Ashkenazi Jews? 
They're Sephardic Jews. They look like, in terms of, of um, their skin intonation, their tonation of their skin, they would look like they belong in the Middle East. There's another group that is much fairer. They would be considered Ashkenazi Jews. They were the Jews that escaped Russia and Germany, for example, during World War II because of the, um, what was happening during that time. So they would be known as Ashkenazi Jews. After the Jews fled the Romans in AD 70, so how did they even get up there? Well, after what happened in AD 70, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, the temple. They went to places like Spain and North Africa and Germany. And in Germany, they became known as Jews living in the land of Ashkenaz or Ashkenazi Jews. Samartia, or the Samartians, this is a map from 1467, and it's called the Second Map of Asia. This would include a number of countries today in Eastern Europe, and I bring that up, because I wanted you to see this is called Samartia, Asiatica. Ashkenaz was also known as Tuisco, or Tuischen, and Mercury. Another variation is Tuscones or um, Deutschmen, say the Jews, making Ashkenaz the father of the Germans. So there are varying names. Now, what do you notice about Mercury? What do you, what's that come to mind when you think of Mercury? Another Roman god, yep, yeah, Roman god of commerce. Have you noticed that there have been multiple mention of gods in the genealogy of Noah? Where did that come from? Let me posit this thought to you. Think about this. People lived a long time before the flood, and things changed radically after the flood. For example, if you look at the length of the bars of the shaded area, I have it starting at Adam, Seth, Enosh, all the way down to Noah. Notice the length of the shaded area. Pretty long time, isn't it? What happens after the flood and everybody born after the flood? What do you notice about the length of those shaded bars? It starts getting shorter, a lot less years, real quick. Noah lived 950 years. Shem lived 600 years. That's important to see. Let me kind of show this another way. In case that doesn't work for you, let me do this. Here's another way to graph it out. Maybe that will make more sense if the first one didn't. Got Adam, Seth, Enosh. Got Noah here. Got Shem. What happened right after that? What do you see there? It's a pretty big drop off real fast, isn't it? Now you can see how Noah can outlive grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren. Same with Shem. Now look at it by the time of Abraham. Abraham, I think, is the last one on the screen. Now, hold that thought. Let's go back to ancestor worship. Most of these cultures, whether it was Greece or Roman or Egyptian, are looking at these ancestors who outlived many other descendants, and you can see how they would come to the conclusion that these are some sort of greater beings than what we are. There's something different about them. Almost seems like they're immortal. If one's ancestors are outliving great, 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 great grandchildren, it makes sense why they are being elevated to the status of gods or immortal. Shem outlived his great, 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 great grandson, Terah, who was the father of Abraham. As people walked away from God and his word, they started to elevate their ancestors. And by the way, ancestor worship is practiced today around the globe. Did you know that? From China to India to Africa to Europe to the Western Hemisphere, we have examples past and present of ancestor worship. Reminds you what Solomon told us a long time ago. There's nothing new under the sun. So, 
I think that might explain why you start seeing these gods coming around and these names, Mercury and all. What about the decrease in age, in ages? What could cause the decrease in life expectancy? Well, a couple thoughts. One thought is it could be de uh, they de-emphasized the diet change. They were vegetarians before, but now they became carnivorous. Maybe the increased oxygen, maybe it was environmental changes. That's a possibility. But my understanding and my reading so far is that two and three are more likely. Perhaps anatomical issues, changes, physical changes, remember. Uh, and then number three, genetic bottlenecks at the flood in Babylon. Let me see if I can kind of give you some examples of why it might be. Look what happens just after three generations of Shem. Notice the age. First generation after Shem, 438 years. That's half of what Grandpa lived, less than half. And then the next one was 433. Next one was Eber, was 464. We have gen three generations after Shem where people lived on average about 445 years. So the first bottleneck is after the flood. The next bottleneck is after Babel. Three generations. Peleg, that's when Babel started. He, was, he lived to 239. His son, 239. And his son, 230 years. So three generations after the flood, we go down to 445 years. Three generations after Babel, we're now averaging 236 years. It continues to drop after that from Abraham. Abraham lived 175 years. To Isaac, to Jacob. Joseph lived 110 years. Moses lived 120 years. It leads to this question. The Japheth and Ham's lines drop equivalently to Shem's line. Was this decrease in age limited only to Shem's line? We don't really know, but there is something mentioned in history, and I'll mention it. Um, we talk about this. Let me try to give you an example, because I, I think this is all. We've talked about this in class, Drew knows. Uh, we've talked about something called a genetic load. Let me give you the skeptics question. Who did Cain marry? Sister. sister, maybe a niece, but probably sister. And we would say that's a bad thing. But up until the time of Moses, you married a close relative. It was not uncommon. God then forbids it when he gives Moses the law. Now, who do you think knows more science and genetics? You think God knows anything about it at all? Yeah. Okay. There's something called a genetic load. Why don't close relatives marry today? Yes. If there, there's going to be strengths and weaknesses with my gene pool. If I marry a close relative, they're probably going to have the same <coughs> strengths and weaknesses. The concern isn't the strengths. What's the concern? then you come up with birth, much more likely to have birth defects. That's why you want to marry somebody who's not a close relative. That's, this is the practical reason why. Because hopefully, like when Deborah and I married, that my weaknesses were, she didn't have the same weaknesses I had and vice versa. And, and that's, does that make sense? It's called genetic load, it's an issue, yes? Um, in the Amish community, they tend to marry, intermarry, and they have a lot more uh, birth defects in yeah. children. So, I use that as an analogy, not as an explanation for why the years went, but it probably, as they started, think about it, as they stayed in their own people groups, I think you were experiencing some of that as well, and I just wonder if that contributed to lower life expectancy. Because now there's not the same group, they've, they've gone into 70 groups, basically, and now they're kind of closer to kin, kind of staying together. I just wonder if that contributed. So I don't know that I could know the answer or anybody knows the answer for sure, but that's a, I put that out there for your consideration. All right. So where are we at? The Japheth and the Ham's 
Klein drop equivalently to Shen Klein. Here's what I was able to find. I read something here. Let me see if I can read it to you. This is a Georgian Chronicle that was translated. You can ask, uh, access it online like I did at the bottom. You can see the website where I actually read this. Let us recall the fact that the Armenians, Georgians, Al, um, Agbanians, some other names I'm not even going to try, Mopkins, Herons, Lex, Eggers, had one father, and that was a Torgamon, son of Tiris, son of Gomer, son of Japheth, son of Noah. And uh, what I liked about this, henceforth shown as example, he was a brave, gigantic man, this Torgamon. At the time of the destruction of the Tower of Babel, interesting that there's a historical note here, this is not a biblical, this is an extra biblical source, and the division of Thomas and the dispersion of mankind throughout the world, uh, Torgama, came and settled between um, these two sets of mountains. He had many women, sons and daughters of his sons and daughters were born and he lived for 600 years. But the country didn't suffice. So he came from a different line. And uh, he lived 600 years. Can you imagine living in a day where people lived hundreds of years? Can you imagine what it would be like trying to get a job? This guy here says, 125 years experience required. Too bad. I have 96 years of experience and I'm still not qualified. Can you imagine that? And that's part of where the theory goes as well. And I, I think people did not develop the diseases that we have today. We'll never know for sure, but I think we can take some pretty good educated guesses as to why that, that, that went down. But um, All right. From whom did the French, Portuguese, and Celts descend? They all share a common ancestry with gold. Gomer, anybody have that in their background? Any of these? Portuguese, French? No. Yes, you would. Portuguese. Oh, you? Yeah, Portuguese. What do you have? Well, French? French? Yeah. Celt? No. <laughs> All right. This is, again, another one of Japheth's sons. This is Gomer, and not the one that was on the TV show. <laughs> Gomer settled in the central part of Europe. Paul wrote to the Galatians, the Galatians, that was a variant of the name Gomer. So, also, Gaul, Galatia, Welsh, um, this was a group in that, uh, let's say, group in that mixed with the Chinese in the east. The word Celt comes from Celtica, a variant of Galatia, Celtic, Caledonia. Very interesting how this kind of all goes together. This is the etymology of Gomer to Gaul. Everybody's heard of Gaul? That would be historical. You'd be dealing with in the area of France. We have the following series of letters, GMR becoming GUR becoming GUL. The final form is to be observed as the more familiar Gaul, where it will be remembered some of the descendants that Gomer had settled. And the connection between the Gauls, the Galatians, and the Celts are all well established historically. Anybody ever make the connection when they were reading about Galatians? There was a connection between the Galatians and Gaul and France. Isn't that interesting? How about this? Where did the Canaanites and the Chinese come from? Why those two? That's interesting. Canaanites and Chinese? Well, the Israelites conquered the Canaanites when they went into the Promised Land. Um, if you remember here, there were, I think, seven different people, seven different groups. Yes, let me go over this side. Land of Canaan, there were seven to be overthrown. The Amorites, Hittites, Jebusites, Kyrgyzites, Hivites, and Sinites, the Amorites. Remember that? We were reading that when you read that in Joshua or Judges. Mm -hmm. They had to do that. Um... They were judged by God in Canaan, and others were assimilated by other groups, including the Israelites. Some fled to other parts of the world. So, Jebusites, where would they have been located in the Promised Land? What city? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. 
Yes. All right. So the Israelites conquered the Canaanites when they went into the promised land. Notice the Sinites. That sounds familiar. Where do we know, what do we know that that sounds like? Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai somewhere over here. Sinai Peninsula. Sinai Peninsula. Where's all that coming from? This ancestry here. They migrated. And Isaiah 49, verse 12 mentions these people. We read, Behold, these will come from afar, and lo, these will come from the north and from the west and from and these from the land of Sinim, or Sin or, which is where a variation. John Gill writes this in his commentary. Manasa ben Israel will have it that the Chinese are intended. Chinese, China is indeed called by Ptolemy the country of the Sinites. So, we still use that term today. So, part of what happened when they were dispersed, some ended up all the way over on the other end there. Now, we talked about Mount Sinai, and we talked about this uh, Sinai Peninsula. we have any evidence with words that we could follow this family, that chain over there? I got one. Anybody heard of the first Sino-Japanese War? <coughs> or the second one? What is Sino referring to? <coughs> the Chinese. Where did the Greeks and the Japanese come from? Now, would you have thought before tonight that these two people groups had a common link? No. no. All right. I'm going to go from Japheth. I'm going to go down to Javan. Javan, I like told you, is Hebrew for Greece. The Greeks were also a seafaring people. Tarshish is one of Javan's sons. So remember we talked about fleeing Jonah 1 and fleeing to Shark Tarshish? So the Greeks, Ionia, Elisha, and the Aeolians, Tarshish, much of the sea coasts um, is Sethim in Hebrew, Macedonia, later settled by Bavaria, Saxony. So many of the sea coasts here are settled by Javan. All the way out here, too, if you notice. Read this here, just so you can see this. This is Daniel 8, verse 21. The shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece. Look up that word. It's Javan in Hebrew. And the large one that's between his eyes is the first. So in the Old Testament, the word is Javan. But in the New Testament, when he had gone through those districts and had given them much exhortation, he came to Greece. That word is Hellas. And it also comes from one of Javan's sons. Because Javan, I'll go to the map here. Because Javan and his clan were seafaring people, they actually had ports in a number of places. One of the ports, anybody heard of the Java Islands? Where'd that come from? Javan. And you can still see the name connection today. Another place was Japan. And Japan was seen as the Tarshish of the East. The farthest west you could go was Tarshish, was in Spain. The farthest east you could go, Tarshish in Japan. Uh, during the age of exploration back in the 1400s, a book was written called The Philippine Islands. And when he writes about Japan, the author states this. This is in the 1400s. And that this was really so and that the principal settler of these archipelagos was Tharsis, Tharsis, son of Javan, together with his brothers. One of the an ancient names for Japan is actually very similar to Javan. And that's how the Greeks and the Japanese are related. Where did the Egyptians come from? Anybody have any Egyptian genealogy? No? 
Genesis 12, verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land, so Abraham went down to Egypt. Hebrew word for Egypt is Mizraim. To sojourn there, for the famine was severe. The Greek name for Egypt is Egyptus, but the Hebrew name is Mizraim. <coughs> Some of Ham's descendants settled between China and India. You see on the map here, with Ham. They settled here just in the area of Israel. Mizraim found Egypt here. There's another location for one of the sons of Mizraim. Libya was founded by Foot, uh, Put, but taken over by um, Lebo, Lebibos, who were the Lehibites or the other one. I don't know why. I don't know. Too much detail. Some of Mizraim settled between China and India. And then there's others we're not quite sure where they settled. Ernie, you'd be interested to know this one. Where did the Africans come from? Norway and England. I was going to say, some came from Norway and England, yes. <laughs> now let's look at this map. One of the major people groups that populated Africa is Put. Now Noah, Ham, Put, that's how it goes, even one of the Native American tribes, the Omer, have a language that can be traced back to Africa. How about that? One of our native Indian tribes actually has a language that can be traced back to Africa. And so you see another one of Ham's sons put and where he was at, kind of the northern and western parts of Africa. And then another one of Ham's sons, Cush. Some of Cush's people settled in India and they became known as the Hindu Kush. Many of the descendants of Kush went to Africa. Ethiopians to this day still call themselves Kushites. So they went this way, area, and then. Now, who was uh, one of the sons of Kush? Was Nimrod. We're going to talk about him more tomorrow. Nimrod remains in Babylon and takes over Eric. And uh, so he was, well, we'll talk more about him. But you can see there's the Hindu Kush over here. Let me try to put a couple sons of hands together so you can kind of see where they covered. Let me see if I can get this done. Where did the Turks come from? The Turks came from Tograma. Most of them settled north and east of modern-day Turkey, but when the Byzantine Empire was waning, they came down and took the land. So they came into Turkey. So they started up here. Oh, sorry, I got to get the next map. So they started up here. They came down into here into Turkey later. There's something I want to read to you from that. I won't do that tonight. I won't get to it. And I'll tell you, all right, let me, let me stop there because there's a little bit more, but I'm going to just go ahead and stop here at the moment. Any thoughts? This is kind of just heavy information. Well, it's not heavy, it's difficult, but it's a lot of information. And it can be overwhelming. Ernie. Yep. When I finish it up tomorrow. So that's where I was going to go with that. But that's a great question. And North America is kind of the more difficult. The further away you get from Babel, the more it's a little bit harder to connect the dots, is from what I understand. Any questions? Anything surprise you tonight? Everything surprised yeah. me. <laughs> Everything did. Never occurred to me. Wait till you find that there is plenty of extra biblical evidence for all of this. This isn't just in the Bible, but there's a lot to support this. The question is, why don't we know that today? And we'll try to answer that tomorrow morning. Yes? The thing I noticed 
every chapter has. We went through a lot of this, and it said, and each group had its own language. Yeah. So they must have planned together and just and started their own nation. Then. But each group had. There are, comes all the way through. He goes through all these names and then each group had its own language. Yeah. I in, in trying to put all that together, I didn't go down that road. I was wanting to. I went down a little bit. There's a, about 70 people groups mentioned in the Table of Nations in Genesis chapter 10. From what I the near I can understand, there's about 7,000 languages today, but they all seem to go back. Philologists put it more like about 90 or so languages. So 70 to 90 range. But it's interesting. If you want to study English or a number of different languages, one language that has a lot in common is Sanskrit. There are a lot of languages that the root or the mother language actually came from Sanskrit. English is one of them. Yes? My community where I came from, some they all tell And I think there's surprises when you start unpacking it like this. Again, it, it can be seen somewhat tedious, but I wanted to do this because I think at some point we're going to be challenged. This is one of those areas that we kind of read, but we don't really know how to unpack. And I don't. I mean, it's not somebody, I wasn't really taught this. This is just something I've had to, on my spare time, read on my own and try to learn. And there's a lot more I want to dig. I got that I, I at least wanted to scratch the surface of it for myself. And I felt like before we start talking about Babylon, we need to understand how Babylon even came about. And and uh, this is one of the areas that I think was was really neat. I wanted to finish that up tomorrow, but I wanted to make sure. Any other thoughts or comments or suggestions, or not suggest? Well, any even suggestions. <coughs> well, I'm glad that at least this is something new for you. And I hope that what you see is that you can, not that you didn't before, but it's really neat to see how God's word just fits together and how it applies to every area of our life, including you know, our, our own history. This is human history right here in Genesis chapter 10. It's amazing how it all goes together and, and fits together like that. I'll finish this up tomorrow morning, and then I will get into uh, uh, Midrock. And Tower of Babel in chapter 11 and chapter 11 of Genesis. We'll do that. Uh, Pastor Roger's going to help out Sunday evening because then, or Sunday evening, Friday evening, he should be here and he is going to talk about Babylon in the book of Daniel. And so that's where we're going to go next. We'll try to get to Revelation. And then what's it, and what I'm hoping that we can glean from it is what it means to live in Babylon. There's a literal sense to it, but I think there's a spiritual sense, and that's where I hope to get to by the end of, the, of our retreat. Mr. Todd, would you close us in prayer for this evening? Okay. Father, we just come before you with our hearts humbled as we are looking at your word, and it amazes me how things begin to just click together, how you've orchestrated things and you put things together that is just so amazing. It words just don't even begin to describe it. Lord, thank you for uh, Pastor Sean taking the time to put and work this stuff out for us and to, to make it so easy for us to, to just hear and to, to take it all in. But Lord, I pray that you would touch our hearts and as we go out into the world, Lord, that it's not just puffed up knowledge, but Lord, it's an application where we can begin to minister to others and help them to see the light of who you are. And we just praise you and thank you now for this weekend, Lord, that you might meet us where we are, and we might meet you in your kingdom. And we just praise you and thank you for that. Amen. Amen. Pastor Sean.